Happy Friday. Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort here this time with the CEO of Marvell, Matt Murphy. Uh, and uh, boy, it's <laughs> can't really ignore the market. I'll just mention it. Uh, I don't want to talk about it at all. But I'll just mention, boy, what a what a ride for the S&P and a number of stocks uh, to close out this week. But I want to talk about what I always uh, do. Today's toughest problem that Marvell is facing, and we have um, talked about Marvell's strategy and opportunity quite a bit in the past. So, you know, what's getting you up in the morning? What's what's getting you excited these days? Yeah, thanks, John, and it's it's great to be here. And I I agree, it's uh, not a time to be paying to the stock paying attention to the stock market every day. Um, and certainly uh, to your to your question. It's really a long-term question, right? And and so when I think about what our biggest, um, I call it challenge and opportunity is, because we, the setup is fantastic in terms of the, the the team that we have, the products, the markets we're in, you know, and, and we can go as deep as you want here, but uh, I I would say actually I think, let's yeah let, let's um because a lot of people who who aren't covering semiconductors every day don't get where Marvell fits uh, into the, the vision of technology's future. I mean, some companies make chips that go directly into things that people carry around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mar Marvell, uh, historically not in that position. So give us the overview of, uh, say, from cloud down to car even, where Marvell's technology fits in. Yeah, no, I think it's a great way to start. And you know, I've I've now been in the chip industry for like 28 years, right? And so when you try to explain to people well, what do you do for a living, you know, the most tangible things to talk about, as you point out, are, are devices, right? Oh, well, we make chips that go into TVs, we make chips that go into phones, we make chips that go into and then people kind of nod their head and you sort of explain that that these are fundamentally the brains and the electronics that power everything that we do. Now, Marvell is unique, John, in that we don't service those types of end markets in general. The consumer portion of our business is like less than 15% of what we do. So 85% of what we do is in the infrastructure of the global telecommunications and, and, um, and uh, data infrastructure network. So basically think of if you've got your phone and you're scrolling in Instagram or you're shopping online or you're searching uh, for something, all of that computation is actually done in the cloud. And it, it could either be done um, as an application hosted by somebody like, like Amazon uh, or, or Google or Microsoft Azure, or it could be an app that's got some unique you know, um, functionality that's, that's served directly to your phone. So we're on the cloud side, we're a very big player there, and we can, we can dive deep into that, but we supply to those large hyperscale companies, companies I just mentioned. We're also a leader in the in the telecom network and the wireless network. So 5G has been in the news a lot, um, especially this week. Uh, that is the, the newest generation of the global cellular standard. Uh, we're the leading company in that in terms of the high performance digital infrastructure, primarily in the in the computing area. And then also we're in uh, enterprises. So you go into the office every day and the, the network that runs your office or, or a campus, as an example, would be powered by Marvell. And then finally, we've applied all those technologies, which are fundamentally data centric, and we've applied those to automotive. And so the cars of the future, uh, the big differentiator is going to actually be all the electronics that's under the hood and the the central computing chips are going to be like the new engine. So that's what Marvell does. And what's unique, John, is we're actually the only pure play company that focuses on that market. We have competitors that we compete against, but they've got other businesses, right? They're in PCs, they're in cell phones, they're in software, they're in, 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 in different businesses. So we're, think of us as the pure play company, if you want to bet on the future of data infrastructure and, and data platform being a, a critical driver of the global economy. Now, I was just talking to another uh, semiconductor industry CEO this morning who is uh, planning to build two chip fabs in Ohio who was saying uh, something along the same lines about the opportunity in cars. Right now, uh, the automotive industry largely using chips that aren't made on the most advanced what they call process technology. They're not you know, the, the highest tech 
chips necessarily, but the idea is that that's changing over the years, and he's hoping that his cutting edge manufacturing facilities will be necessary for the chips that are going into cars. Similarly, is that the direction that you see cars heading in? They're getting smarter, and because that's happening, the sorts of uh, technology that Marvell has is gonna be more important there? Yeah, I think, John, if you go back over the last, call it 30 years, and you just sort of look at it, there was an era where electronics made its way into in the automobiles and you had some basic functions like windshield wiper control, automatic braking systems. Think of it as more body type of applications. And, and then, you know, there was this huge growth over the last, call it 10 years or so, 15 years in infotainment, right? And you've sort of got all these great consumer technologies like touchscreen, great audio, USB charging, LED, you know, that all came into the car, into the cabin, and the consumer experience took over. And now what you're referring to is what we talk about is the next generation and the next big wave in automotive, which is really the data-centric um, generation. And that's primarily driven because cars and, and people uh, wanna be safer, they wanna have more connectivity, they wanna move to electrification, and so all of those trends are actually creating a need now for high performance computation, high performance networking, uh, you know, best in class security and tons of storage inside the car because of all the data. Those are the exact types of fundamental IPs and technologies that Marvell has. And so we intend to be a very big player in this next wave of um, semiconductor demand in automotive, which I think will be the most profound of any wave we've ever seen in semiconductor content inside um, the automotive market. Well, let me try this on you, because I think this is a tough problem that I see out there, is that we're talking about the automotive market, and I'm hearing the car makers look at Tesla over the past year and say, wow, okay, Tesla was able to deal with this environment where we couldn't get components better because they were able to rewrite their software to uh, to work with the chips available. Whereas we were taking so many off the shelf things from so many suppliers, when we couldn't get those off the shelf things, we, we just couldn't make cars. So we need to be more flexible, right? So you got that on one side, where you got car makers who are saying, we wanna be more flexible, we're gonna have these custom needs for chips, we're gonna get smarter about this. But then you got the hyperscalers who you were talking about, the cloud players like AWS, uh, Microsoft, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, who are at such a huge scale that they're saying, we want special custom chips for our cloud that work just for us. Now, it, it seems like it might be a challenge to do custom stuff for all these different players and still have the best performance possible. Because in the past, best performance, well, I make the best chip, the best performance, you can have it in any color as long as it's black. How do you solve, as Marvell, how do you solve for that where you're flexible, you wanna be flexible, but you got so many customers and powerful customers who want something different? Sure, well, I think, first of all, I think what's really needed, John, to be successful in that um, ability to customize and optimize is actually the word I would use for, for um, not just the, the, the hyperscale cloud market, which, which as you point out, has huge economies of scale and, and definitely a, 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 a significant economic benefit to go to, to an optimized solution. But the automotive companies are absolutely going the same route, both for continuity of supply and having a deeper relationship you know, directly with the, the, uh, the semiconductor partners, but also the ability to get much higher performance out of the application. So as somebody like Marvell, well, how do you do that and actually scale, right? Because ultimately, if you do too many things that are customized for too many people, you could run out of gas. The, the way that we've um, actually architected the company with our organic investments over the last five years, as well as all the M&A moving pieces that we've done, um, and including some divestitures of things that didn't fit, John, the way to think about it is we have a technology platform, okay, which we we put on, for example, our latest one that we're on now is on is at TSMC and it's on five nanometer on their most high performance version of that process. All of the fundamental IPs in Marvell and technologies are on that platform. So we have best in class storage IP, best in class computing IP based on the ARM architecture, best in class networking IP. 
uh, DSPs, uh, security, you name it. And so think of that as the capability we have. And then our differentiated model is we can go in and very efficiently work with these different OEMs and actually build them exactly what they want. And because we're already developing those IPs and that um, technology for our own products, our own standard products, they're proven. They work, they're, they're, they're in high volume production and we can show that that's actually proven and available. And by the way, we can take, take it and make exactly what you want. And so setting all that up has actually been a, a tremendous lift to get there. And it's a huge barrier to entry now because you literally have to have your entire technology set on one monolithic platform in order to be able to do this customization efficiently. And then the second thing is, um, if you can deliver enough value, John, then you can actually get, as part of the business model, co-funding from these very important OEM customers. So you both put skin in the game and develop it together and that helps underwrite the risk, but it also improves the chance of success if, your customer on the other side is as invested as you are both financially as well as in the solution it provides. So it's a real trend, okay? We see it in 5G, we see it in the in the cloud, and it's increasingly becoming a trend in the automotive market that I think is here to stay. Huh, well, um, gonna look forward to seeing how that plays out. And I wanna come back to talking more about Marvell specifically and the vision, where things go from here. But now I wanna, uh, learn about you. Um, and I like to start at the very beginning, like where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, siblings. Sure, well, um, as, as I mentioned when uh, we were just chatting before this, I'm, I'm turning 50 years old this year. So I was born in 1972. I, I was born in uh, Boston, Massachusetts um, in, in Cambridge and then grew up my first few years in, in New England. Um, I moved around a lot when I was a, a kid. So my dad, who was a big influence on my life, uh, role model, you know, mentor, he actually uh, originally first worked for Honeywell, then worked for Wang Laboratories, if you remember them, and then worked for Apple. He actually joined Apple in 1983 oh, in, wow. in their sales organization. He was in the first sales force that, that was hired into Apple. And he had a meteoric rise in his career as because you know Apple obviously was had, had done extremely well in that era. And so we moved around a lot when I was a kid. Um, and I uh, won't go through all the locations, but I ended up going to four different high schools. Um, I uh, uh, you know uh, had, had you know it wasn't easy at times, uh, but it certainly built some resilience. Um, I've got yeah, tell, tell me about that. I want to I like to park in the in the yeah. childhood for for a little bit. So your your dad, it sounds like, was in technology sales. He was before technology sales was a very widely known thing outside of you know probably selling to government or institutions or things like that. Um, what did did you have interesting uh, equipment or gadgets around the house as a result of this? Absolutely. I, I grew up um, with technology all around me. In fact, there's, there's, uh, there was an ad that, that Wang published you know, in, in all the newspapers in, in the late 70s, early 80s. I was in the ad. Actually, that Charlton Heston was the only time Charlton Heston ever did a paid advertisement was for Wang. So they must have paid him a ton of money. But I was the kid you know, in the in the uh, in the ad with the, with the mini computer. So when my dad worked for Apple, we had every generation of Apple computer in my house from when I was very young, from Apple II to Apple IIe, the original Mac. So I grew up um, with a lot of technology around me. And you're right, it was kind of a, a a niche sort of thing. I mean, I would you know, growing up, my friends would say, "Well, what is your what your parents do?" Well, my dad works for Apple. He works for Apple, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, but it was it was a challenge to you know on the one hand it was a challenge to move around a lot as a kid you know and if you moved when you were growing up to be the new person um, and they were in different parts of the country from California to Colorado to Connecticut uh, but what I what got built through that was um, understanding that people are very different depending on where their point of view is where where you come from and and um, each of these actually schools I went to had all kinds of diversity to them, okay? And so, in different environments completely. So I think I learned a lot about people and I learned how 
it's not always easy to be the new person. And so it's more about listening than actually talking. And it really helped me in my career as I later then started taking over all these bigger groups as I advanced in my career. And, you know, at one point I was running worldwide sales for my prior company. And I always had an appreciation, you know, for the person on the other side of the table that they may have a completely different, you know, viewpoint than me. Um, so what but, was your, yeah. what, what was your opening move? When you ended up in this new environment, you're the new kid. Was there a go-to sport or activity or you know class subject where you felt yeah. most comfortable and, and related? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a great um, it's a great one because I, I was very fortunate in, in a couple of ways. One is um, I, I I was a, a, a an athlete, so I was uh, a distance runner. So I ran both cross country, um, indoor track, and outdoor track, and I actually ran also in college as well. So I always had something in common because in, in high school sports, the cross country season is in the fall. So when I would move, I would meet the new team and, and get to know them even before school started because I would always, my parents would reach out to the whoever was coaching um, the school program. So I always had sort of a, a group of people and if in kind of any, any athletic endeavor, when you have a team sort of sport, that becomes a backstop, if you will. And then the second is I was always a pretty smart kid. So I ended up in sort of the, call it the AP classes. So that's always a little bit of a niche you can end up in. So think of me as the runner, you know, kind of AP kid. Um, and uh, that, uh, and I made great friends, John. I mean, I, these are people I, great friends of mine to this day, you know, I'm on email threads with these guys and, you know, it's just, you, you build lifelong bonds, even sometimes if you live somewhere for, for just a year. So I always encourage well, people to do. Yeah. Yeah, what, what I remember about the distance runners when I was in high school was for that sport, some sports like football, basketball, people come to watch, right? And so sometimes the attention of the team is on being watched and, you know, cheerleaders are cheering for you. The distance runners, especially cross country, you're gone. Like no, right. nobody's watching you. <laughs> yeah. you're, talk, you're talking to each other maybe, you, right. you know, eventually. So, so they were kind of tight with each other. But by virtue of the type of team they were, I don't know if you if that was your experience. Totally. Well, yeah. I mean, these races are, first of all, the train, right? It depends on where what level you're at. But you could be running, you know, 30, 40 miles a week in in high school, and I mean, you've run 90 miles a week in college. I mean, you're 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 out there on the roads with these folks, and then even when you have a race, you know, they're anywhere between 5,000 and 8,000 meters. So, you know, you're you're basically out there. So it's definitely a sport where you have to have a lot of um, you know, uh, the, the satisfaction comes from a lot of personal challenge and benchmarking and kind of goal setting versus uh, outside accolades coming in. Like, you know, you, you won the high school football game. It's really about uh, competition. It's about pushing yourself. There's very much times that you want to hit and achieve and goals that you set. And I mean, I, I sort of translated that later in my life because I, I always wanted to do an Ironman as a triathlete. And um, so I, I went from being a runner in high school and beyond, and then I started doing triathlons when I was in my twenties and I eventually did, you know, uh, two full Ironmans, um, when I was in my early forties and I qualified for the world half Ironman championships in 2014. Um, you know, so I was able to translate a lot of that, um, athletic sort of background and, and training and history of how to actually train, <laughs> perform, and and compete. And it's been a very important part of my life, actually. And um, it's it sort of- kept Why, why yeah. is that? Because that's a, that's a period like 2014 and, and leading up to it, one of the more critical points in your career, right? Like you're, you're reaching right. a big time, but at the same time, you're training for Ironman competitions, which is really, right. did, did, did that help you overall? Was it a distraction? How did, how did, clearly it wasn't a distraction. How did that fit into the other things that were important that you were trying to do? Yeah, I, I, I think I've, if I look back over my career, John, I think the times that I've actually performed the best in my career are when I've actually had the most success and consistency in fitness and athletics. And it's going to sound like, well, how do you fit all that, that in? And you know, how do you, how do you have time? You know, how do you, and you know, I always, you know, my view is John, it's, it's a, it's a hundred percent a discipline issue. I mean, 
you basically have to decide what's important to you. And if you decide that health is important to you, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to run or you don't have to do Ironmans, but if you decide that that being physically fit and mentally fit is important, then you have to make the time. And so I made the time, you know, and so go to bed early, get up at 5 a.m., get everything knocked out before work. Um, I have three kids, you know, who were who were younger at that time. Um, my my wife played a huge role in sort of, and she's she by the way is an endurance athlete, and she's done multiple ultra marathons, and so she also can appreciate kind of what it takes. And we've been able to support each other through those different athletic endeavors. So you know, she's got the kids, and I go knock it out. And I remember I would do my long bike rides at five five thirty in the morning with headlamp on and ride with other people and get it done and be done at nine and go watch a soccer game or, you know, so you just have to sort of make the time for it um, and, and make it a priority. You can always make an excuse. You're too busy. I'm having busy for 28 years, right? <laughs> but you know, and, and I, I, and I've ebbed and flowed, but, but I've always felt the best about how I'm doing. I've performed the best in my career when I've actually had this sort of other set of goals and things that I'm working on most of which nobody has any clue I'm even doing. You know, I'm just, no, nobody really cares that I'm doing some half Ironman or doing some race, but but actually it's a big deal to me. I've got times I want to achieve and people I'm competing with and friends that I do it with. And it's, 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 uh, and it's a great analogy, you, know, you, you draw a nice analogy to your career in life. You know, if you look at sort of what it takes from a discipline and focus and consistency standpoint to perform. So let me dip back into college. Um, that, that's sort of a, a stage where we were. So what are you majoring in at the time and what do you think you're going to do with it? Yeah, I actually, it was interesting. So I, as I told you, I grew up with a lot of technology um, and I, uh, you know, I didn't you know, like a lot of people, right? I mean, I think these days, I think people are probably a little bit, you know, certainly high school students because I have one daughter in college and two in high school. Kids now, I mean, a lot of them have figured out what they want to do when they're like in high school. I want to do, now, I, I'm not sure that's all going to pan out, by the way, but that's sort of, you know, pe people think they know what they want to do. And I don't know, maybe like a lot of us that graduated college in the, well, the 90s or early 90s, it, it was a little bit like, you know, graduate and get a job type of thing. I actually, the funny story is, I actually thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And my two hmm. post college roommates of mine, um, and and like three of my friends all went to law school. Okay, and I thought about it, um, you know, and I just I didn't want to, I didn't want to keep going to school at that point. You know, I, <laughs> I kind of wanted to work, and um, I had uh, had a couple of different internships the prior two summers at technology companies, um, and. I ended up getting a job um, basically through a family friend at a company called Maxim Integrated Products, which was uh, at the time it was a hundred million dollar kind of revenue company. It was publicly traded, you know, and it was in the semiconductor field and the analog field. And I was so fortunate, John, to, to join that company. Um, I started off in product marketing, but then I quickly got to do all kinds of other things. But it turned out I joined that company, okay, the prior 12 months revenue was 100 million. In six years later, it was a billion dollar company. Mm. Stock had split four times. The CEO that I worked for, you know, that was our, our the founder of the company, um, this guy, Jack Gifford, who, who founded it in 1983, he was a legend in the semiconductor industry. He was a unbelievably strong leader and somebody that I looked up to. And so I had this amazing opportunity where it was a good company, growing really fast, he liked actually bringing in young people and training them and giving them opportunities. And I got to work under a, a an industry icon where I learned so much about leadership, actually working under him, you know, not necessarily for him, but working in a company w which he led. And so, you know, I, and, and the, the other ironic thing is I ended up staying there, John, for 22 years. The, the yes. Kid, the kid <laughs> that moved around, right. You know, all the time, uprooted. I, um, I'm, I've been a very consistent person relative to my career. And, you know, I've been at Marvell, only two companies, right? I worked at Maxim for 22 years and I've been at Marvell. This year will be my sixth year um, in July. 
And, uh, you know, and I see a long term future for me here. And I think, you know, you can, by the way, you can build an amazing career inside your own company. You know, the notion that you, you have to jump every two or three years or five years or one year, whatever it is, to be honest, a lot of those people, they never actually go through the learning cycle. Well, so let me get two things yeah. um, from that. First, from the college end, you, you went to a liberal arts college like I did. Yeah. Um, how much did that influence your abil ability or willingness to change your plan from law to whatever else? And did that mindset at all help you to go through whatever changes you needed to go through early and mid-career uh, to stay relevant in the organization? That's a good question. I, you know, I, I, maybe, I mean, I think, you know, the, the beauty of having a, a broad background and liberal arts is a great way to do it is you get, you do get exposed to so much. And I, I remember, you know, as an example, I took a class on China and Japan, you know, and this is China, this is probably 1992, right? I mean, China was not the superpower that it is today. And I still remember that class and I still remember the history of where actually at one point where the Chinese were and then where they went and where they were going in it. How would you ever get that experience? You know, and I remember taking all kinds. So I, so I had a, I had a pretty, you get a pretty broad perspective, right. As, as you probably went through as well. And so I think it does give you a, a, a broader mindset. I, I do, I do see people sometimes that we, we ended up hiring, that come from a very, very narrow background and maybe come in and they're hired for one particular job or skill. And, you know, getting people the broader perspective is actually um, really important. And um, and uh, it's it's not in, in, in the way that the global education system is today. It's actually not like that anymore. There's sort of a premium put on specialization, but I'm actually not so sure that in isolation, that's the best thing ultimately. Because if you look at some of the the best leaders we've seen in 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 the technology industry, they end up having different backgrounds, different points of view, different experiences. Right? It doesn't have to just be college, but that ultimately made them what they were. I mean, look at Steve Jobs. You know, and there's great stories about how did he come up with the concept of fonts? And it's because he took a calligraphy class when he dropped in at Reed College. I mean, there's these these things that you you see and do. And I think if you just come from a completely narrow background, if you will, field of study, or just not really look at the bigger picture, it's sometimes it's harder to envision and have a perspective of what's um, what's out there. So how do you think you manage to keep from getting either pigeonholed or put a, getting a, a ceiling put over you in the organization? You were able to stay uh, at maximum for more than 20 years? Yeah, well, I think I, I thought a lot about um, my career. I thought a lot about, you know, what, at some point I, I, I mean, I, I don't think I necessarily sat there and said, I want to be a CEO someday. I mean, that was, that was sort of later, but I, I definitely was ambitious. I definitely was competitive and I wanted it just by nature, you know, wanted to, wanted to do well for all the reasons that people, you know, <laughs> Generally speaking, you know, want to get a job and do well. And well, but what are what are those reasons? Because I think people have different reasons. Some people just like beating the competition, whoever that happens to be. They they need somebody right. to to beat. Uh, some people are you know driven by uh, deep insecurity. Some people are driven, by, you know, like so. What what was it for you? There's fame. There's wealth. There's there's all kinds of reasons, right? So I and it's it's interesting after. You know, as I went through my own calculus at the time of leaving Maxim, because by the time I left, um, it was 2016. I was, I was the number two person in the company. You know, so I, I worked for a great CEO, the successor to Jack Gifford, a guy named Tunch Delusia, who um, retired as the CEO when he sold it to Analog Devices. So I worked for two CEOs. Um, but I was a number two guy. Okay, and I was sort of can tent, if you will, to stay doing that. And then at some point, if I were to be the successor, that'd be great. And then when Marvell came along, I had to do this soul searching, right, that you talked about, which is, okay, if I was going to leave, why would I do it? 
And as I look back through my career, I'll, I'll just kind of point to one specific thing that's always driven me is impact. The ability to make an impact, to make a difference, okay? Whether that's taking an organization that's not in great shape, right? Maybe it's like not well-respected internally, or for example, the first product line that I was given responsibility for was the worst product line in the whole company at Maxim. Worst product line. And so they gave it to me because you know, nobody else wanted it. And I did a great job with it, you know? And I it was so, so I've never been the one that wanted to take the sweet group, the shiny object, and then actually kind of ride the ride the coattails. It's I think you can actually, and, and maybe it, it speaks to my own desire to see improvement, but but I take a lot of pride and, and I get a lot of satisfaction out of the impact. And so when I was looking at Marvell, to be honest, I saw this company in deep trouble. You know, revenues were shrinking, there was scandal, scandals around, you know, um, the inability for the company to get its financials filed with the SEC. There had been you know, kind of the wrong markets there. There's a lot of issues. And I looked at that as a huge opportunity because basically in the end, I concluded, I actually think I can help the people and the company of Marvell a lot more than I could help the team I was working with at Maxim because they were so good and it was going well. And I felt it was okay to leave, you know, but basically I wanted to, I was out to prove something a little bit to myself. You know, I've, I'm not a, I don't know. I've never viewed, I'm not a cult of personality type of CEO. You don't really see me on Twitter, John. You don't, you know, I, I'm more about what, what, what does the team accomplish, but I do, but what does drive me is, um, uh, and I get the satisfaction from being able to make an impact. And um, is that similar? to how you attack a triathlon, uh, because there are different skills by, by nature that different tasks that you have to uh, tackle in order to improve your time. Are you looking at um, what your weakest area is and, and how you can improve it? I, I think we got a, a little bit of an issue with your camera, so let me make sure we get that back and I mean, we have it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, do you do you look for those areas of optimization even outside of business when you're looking to make improvement? Absolutely. I mean, I think the way to to think about it is just like take running a company, right? If you if if you want to if you want to run a really good company, then you know you can focus on a few things. Like, I want to make a great product. I want to have a great customer support. I want to have my, the best uh, financials and capital allocation, whatever, whatever you pick, right? And a lot of leaders, to be honest, they, they get pegged as, well, that, that, that person's a sales guy, that person's a product guy, that person's a, but the great companies, and I'm gonna get to my athletic analogy in just a second, are the ones that focus much more broadly, okay? And focus on improving the operations and the performance of all aspects of the company, which requires lots of different skill sets, lots of different experience to, to know kind of what to do and what not to do. And if I look at like, let's just take a take an Ironman triathlon, which by the way, it, you know, I, I never thought I could do. I mean, I, you know, it sounds like this hypothetical thing. How would I actually train for it? And when you actually look at what that takes, John, it's not just, well, you gotta go swim 2.4 miles and then you'd run over and you hop on a bike and you ride 112 miles and you just jump off of that. And you're, you, yes, you have to do those things, but it's the nutrition. Well, first of all, it's it's the training. It's actually putting in the right uh, work for a long period of time with basically no, you know, no positive reinforcement, if you will. But it's it's developing those skills. It's the transitions. I mean, you wouldn't believe this, but if you actually look at the transition between the swim to bike, the bike to run, there's a huge amount of time that gets eaten up in there. People struggle to put on their shoes, right? So you, there's an efficiency there. There's the nutrition, you know, how much do I drink? What, how many calorie, calories am I burning per hour? What do I actually want to do to fuel myself? How do you keep yourself mentally focused? So it's actually not just you go grunt out, you know, gr grind out an Ironman. You, you know, you, you really have to think it through. It's an intellectual challenge that requires, you know, kind of multiple, um, disciplines and and sort and you have to build experience you actually have to have done enough races and training heading up into it that you can you tow that starting line you've got the confidence you're going to get there 
So there's a lot of correlation, to be, to be honest. It sounds to me like if you didn't expect or plan long term to do an Ironman, uh, somebody described the process to you. And in the description of it, uh, you felt dared to do challenged to do it, like you had to do it. What's the story on how you actually decided, OK, this is something I'm going to do? Well, you know, I, I think I was fortunate that um, two of my uh, two of my uncles on my mom's side, they were both runners, by the way. They both ran for University of Indiana and they were both triathletes. OK, in, 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 in the 1980s and 90s. And in fact, one of them today, age 66, he's still last year he raced and he made the world championships. I mean, it's just, you know. So I, I grew up around a very a athletic sort of family. And, and I remember in 1988, we were moving to the San Francisco Bay Area um, from, uh, from Colorado. And my two uncles were doing the Escape from Alcatraz triathlon. And back then, you know, it was, again, call it back in the day, right? You were actually, they would allow spectators to ride on the ferry um, out to Alcatraz and you could actually see all the athletes jump in the water. And then the course at that time, you'd swim to aquatic park, transition to the bike. And then the, the, the bike actually used to go across the Golden Gate Bridge. And then, then the run was the double dipsy. And John, you were in the Bay Area for a while. So it, that was over, over Mount Tam to Stinson Beach and back. And I remember watching them, you know, jump in the water. And then I was there for the transition and, you know, and I was probably 16 years old and I thought, this is pretty cool. Like, I want to do this. So I'd say probably from when I was 16, I, 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 and then, and then they both, um, did longer distance stuff. And my, one of the uncles did the Hawaii Ironman and it was like, wow. So I think I always had this as a goal, you know, call it, call it family competition, call it, you know, looking up to your, your, your role models and people that, you know, and people that that's in your family. But I probably had that goal since I was 16 and, and I just couldn't envision how I would actually do it. Um, and then I figured out how to, I got a coach and I had people I became friends with that are still my training partners to this day. And, you know, through, through, through a team effort, I was able to do it. And actually the two of them I did, I, I did very well relative to what I thought I could do. I executed both of those about as well as I've executed anything in my life, quite frankly. And it wasn't just because I trained a bunch and I got in shape. Um, I, I sort of battled all the odds, if you will, right? And did all the right things. And you make one mistake in that, by the way, you know, you don't, don't, don't prepare correctly, you could blow up. You know, you can go from doing a 10 or 11 hour Ironman to a 17 hour, hour Ironman really fast. Um, mm -hmm. And fortunately, at least in those two, I, uh, I was able to perform to my expectations or better. Um, well, I think now is a time where I want to transition to uh, a question uh, I call Death Valley about your lowest point, because I think there's a lot of learning in how you got through whatever that was. Was there a point where whatever plan you had um, hit a wall and you thought, I've got to figure something else out at, at any stage? Uh, of your journey, what was the the most difficult period uh, decision thing that you had to tough out? Sure. Well, I got all kinds of stories about that, but I'll I'll just pick one <laughs> because it, you know, and a lot of it's funny. A lot of you know, we we've done very well as Marvel, right? I mean, if if you just look back, a lot of people say, "God, this thing looks like a textbook." I mean, I can't find anything you guys did right. You know, it was a three point four billion dollar market, you know, enterprise value company when you started, and Back at the high water mark, John of the Nasdaq, you know, back in December, we hit 80 billion. You know, it looks like a up, line up into the right, but along the way, you know, all, all kinds of um, all kinds of stuff to deal with. One of them that was 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 very difficult was on the first acquisition we did. You know, we we um, which has turned out to be the most consequential decision we took. I took, you know, as a young CEO, was basically to acquire and really merge with a company called Cavium, which was an excellent company and um, always respected them. But, you know, when we did that deal, I mean, it, it looks so obvious at the time, but I bet everything on that. We, we, we paid 85% of our enterprise value, John, to acquire Cavium. Okay. 
And everything looked great. The financials looked great. The, the Wall Street reception was phenomenal. Actually, our our stock appreciated. I think you know it went from eighteen bucks to twenty four bucks by the time we you know solidified the deal to when it got announced. I mean, I, the, the buyer stock went up, right? And what happened is in the pendency of the close, there was a slowdown at that time in Cavium's business for a couple different reasons. But it wasn't we we couldn't see it when we did diligence. To, to be fair to the Cavium team, they couldn't see it, but it happened. And all of a sudden, before we closed. They were having to put out financial statements basically without any context because once you're in a in a deal situation you can't do an earnings call and numbers were coming in below consensus and everybody freaked out and it was like you know investors got very spooked and it was a real it was a it was really tough to get through because it was a credibility hit right on what had been a very you know strong track record for me and my team um, but you know, we did. So, what was the what was the um, the counter argument at that point? Was it, hey, you got to get, you got to lower the price on this deal, you got to scuttle this deal altogether? Well, you could certainly, you know, start to go down those dark paths, right? Because you could start claiming things, right? There's, 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 and deals fall apart in the pendency when when things change. I think to the credit of of my team and my board. You know, we elected to take the long view, John, which was nothing had changed fundamentally with the quality of that Cavium team. Nothing had changed with the roadmap. And we understood the air pocket. And um, we decided to effectively take the high road. We didn't renegotiate the price. We closed it um, very rapidly. We got China approval. Um, by the way, this was back in 2018, if you remember, basically the week that Qualcomm and NXP got scuttled, the week before we got approval for our deal. So we just, we powered through, we, we and, and I, I felt it would be very damaging, okay, to try to go and be penny wise, pound foolish. Um, we brought the team on board, we, we, we got with it, um, uh, three board members came as part of it, they're, they're phenomenal, two of them are still with us, one of them rolled off to go do his own company. Uh, key members of my management team have come from Cavium, our president of products and technologies, who is one of the founders of Cavium, uh, who reports to me is on my team, um, Raga Bussain. He's, he's still with us. And if you look at our success, John, in 5G, and fundamentally these, these new markets we're addressing, a lot of that core capability came from that company. And so, so the things one bad quarter, it was actually nothing to worry about, but. It, but look, when you're getting but you make it you make it sound easy. Why was <laughs> why was that hard? Uh, was there a particularly large investor that was trying to get you to go in a different direction? Was it were, were oh, yeah. you well, second guessing part well, of it? What was hard about that? Well, the stock the stock fell. I mean, we we so we were at eighteen bucks a share, right? When we when we negotiated the deal post post announcement, we were at twenty four. Things were looking great. We had a whole plan in front of us. And then, you know, when this, when this, uh, when this um, was, was known, you know, stock went back to like 18, 19 bucks, it fell way back down. And it was like, wow, didn't you do your diligence? Didn't you do your homework? I mean, it, so yeah, it, it, investors at that time, John, rightly so, you know, were concerned that maybe we didn't do our homework. Maybe we weren't thorough enough. Maybe, you know, what, what, did, you, what did you guys miss? It was very, it was, it was very stressful. You know, and then and then um, how long did it take you to realize that it wasn't something that you missed? Uh, was there was there any additional uh, diligence or conversation that you had to go through to make sure that you understood what the issue was? I mean, how, how long did that process take? For yeah, you? yeah, my, my well, people that were involved know it was uh, it was uh, not a pushover uh, in, in terms of uh, my own, you know, digging into the uh, kind of how did this happen, if you will. I think in the end, by the time we closed, okay, and the, the quarter after that we guided, the revenue was actually, the inventory that was there had been burned through and revenue was ramping back up. And to be honest, we I learned a lot and we learned a lot about how to appropriately um, uh, judge, okay, and then de-risk and value the subsequent acquisitions. And so if you look, 
for example, you know, we acquired a, a company after that called Aquantia, and it was doing, you know, 13 million bucks a quarter when we bought it. We said we it'll it'll do a 100 million a year in 2020, and it handily beat that number. You know, we did Avera. We said it was a 300 million dollar run rate when we acquired it. A year after we bought it, it was doing way over 300. You know, you you saw with Infi, right? It was um, it was uh, you know supposed to be a dilutive transaction for the first year plus, and we got it. We made it accretive in the first quarter. So, I think we also learned, John, and that's part of that's part of uh, that's part of life, you know, and that's part of business. Is you're not going to do everything perfect, and I think the key is: do you dive in? Do you understand what happened? Is it you know, you, you take the necessary course corrections and then do you learn from it kind of institutionally? And we've gotten now very good, I think, at, 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 at doing this. And as a result, if you look at the cumulative value creation from all these acquisitions, it's been astonishing. Um, so there was a stumble and it was tough. We're, we're, we're getting to what I wanted to get out of this, <laughs> which is why I flashed that up there. But um, sort of distill it for me out of that experience whether it has to do with under-promising and over-delivering, whether it has to do with building in an, an expectation of the unexpected. What was it that you learned from that that's become a tool in your toolbox that you continue to use? Yeah, well, I, I think it, it reinforced um, something I learned when I was at Maxim, a, a term really, a concept from, from Jack. And, and that was the idea that, because you, you kind of talked about a, a, a notion that's fairly typical where people get kind of, oh, is that a under promise, over deliver type of person? Is that somebody that leans in? And, you know, you kind of, in different CEOs, different management teams orient themselves differently. But the, the way, the, what I was kind of trained on, and I think this experience I went through really reinforced it, was what, what I call most probable outcome. OK, so when you step back and it's actually a very disarming phrase, if you just sort of get everybody in the room and, you know, and there's biases injected into all these conversations, you know, people are hiding the ball. They don't want to quite tell you how good or bad it could be. And, you know, and so the, the way that you kind of disarm a lot of this and you can get the information right, just get the facts on the table, because that's the hardest part sometimes is you get get your framework wrapped around most probable outcome. OK, so let's talk about the. The bad scenario. Let's talk about what 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 it could be, and then let's converge on what we think that looks like. And I, I tell you, it's a very powerful concept. Which I think, looking back, uh, you know, I should have implemented that more as we thought about what are the range of outcomes, you know. And I, it so so going through the situation we did, it it really reinforced to me as we. And and we do this not just on you know revenue forecasting for a particular M and A transaction. This is embedded into Marvel's culture. This is how I try to get really ultimately. It's about getting the right, accurate, real information to the people that need to actually make the decision, and punch out as many of the biases as you can that are inflicted from all kinds of sources, so you can make the right decision. Now tell me why this works. Is it because there are some people, some of us uh, operate on that middle assumption where we're like, well, I'm, I'm going to assume probably the worst isn't going to happen. Probably the best isn't going to happen. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. And so when we're talking about expectations. That's what we're talking about. Whereas some of us are kind of, we live in hope and optimism. Right. And we're just like, when we talk about what's probably going to happen, we're talking about the best case scenario. And unless you do that most probable outcome exercise, you think they're talking about the middle when really they're talking about the high end? Is that why that works? It is, but I, I think you bring up a really good point, and that is the other important aspect of leadership in this whole process is that you've got to know your team. You've actually got to know the people, and it's like anything, like in sports. Look at Bill Parcells. If you looked at his, now you don't have to agree with Bill Parcells in terms of he was he was he was a hard guy and he was in people's faces and that's sort of his rep, right? But if you actually looked at his approach, he managed those players on his team very differently, very differently, and he knew how to push people's buttons, right? He knew how to which ones he's going to give a really hard time to, 
which ones that he's going to actually let um, let do let them do their own thing, be a little bit more autonomous because he knew that they were going to go kind of do the right thing when no one was looking. So you have to know your team and you have to know the people. And that helps that that's essential, because if you just walk in a room of random people and say, hey, let's let's get most probable outcome. You're right. You can get these skews. So. So I think it's 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 but it's a really important role of leadership. I mean, it's ultimately about getting that your team to a common understanding of reality. And that's not a given um, because it's like parenting, right? <laughs> to, to, so now I'm not I'm not saying they're like kids, but no. I, but but I am saying when when you're saying that I'm thinking about well I've got one of my sons is so self-critical or hard on himself he doesn't ever need me to criticize his performance because right. I know he's doing that anyway right? right and then I got another one who's who's different right and so my approach to him is you know explain 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 because you know he needs to feel like what whatever needs to happen is his idea and I just feel like I've got to know that to get results you do you do and it you could you could use the parenting analogy you could use as I use the sports analogy um, and different people perform better under different environments you know some it's just but so you have to really you have to be in the details okay and you have to invest in knowing and and for me by the way i don't just view that as well i've got x number of people reporting to me directly and that's who i'm going to go focus on you know my, my view is john you know we got call it 100 leaders in the company that are at the vp level or senior level to kind of in above right and i view that as that, that's my team, right? And these are people that not only not only because I want to understand where they're coming from to improve decision making, but they also want to know that their boss and their CEO knows them, knows who I am, knows where I come from, knows my background, knows my history, knows my point of view. And some of it isn't just because, oh, well, this person's this way. When you get to know people in business, you realize, oh, well, they're that way because they were uh, a refugee from Vietnam and escaped when they were 13 years old and were picked up by an aircraft carrier and taken to Subic Bay in the Philippines and moved to the, well, why is the person away? Well, that helps you. you know. So you, I, I, I think you, you, you know, part of this is also knowing it. So it's knowing your team, but it's not in a just sort of a throwaway kind of comment. It's actually knowing people's backgrounds and where they come from. And, and it's been hard to do it in the pandemic. You know, it's like, that that connectivity is so crucial ultimately for teams to perform on, on, on any um uh you know in, in any kind of venue you talk about you know against sports family you know uh, or or business and so there's no there's no substitute for the human touch yeah. and and you know it's just a good reminder as we go on soldier on to multiple years into this that you know, the Zoom life can't can't go on. I mean, I only know you in 2D, John. I know, but we connect so well. I feel like I know you, but I yeah, mean, I know but... you. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't done our, you know, go have a beer in person. But we got to we got to do that. Um, in between variants, I hope we're done with the, you know, with the the, the serious, you know, serious variants. Um, now I want to circle back to to, to Marvell and talk about 2022 and uh and beyond and so you've had uh quite a bit of success you've outlined uh the strategy and and kind of the plan of the recent analyst meeting there was a a big stock reaction to that the stock is back where it was before you announced that but everybody else's stock is like we're way below where it was at the time so relatively still fantastic but um but beneath just those numbers and beneath that plan what is it that you are trying to build what what skill what muscle what capability within marvell over the next year or two yeah it's a great question and you know there's been various phases of this journey from you know effectively the basics at the beginning like hey let's get let's get our financials back on file with the sec <laughs> that was not even in place right when i became ceo and we had to actually stop the delisting from nasdaq so you talk about kind of a, a death valley that was sort of you know you got, you got needs and you've got wants, right? So as, as we've on, been on our arc of 
of growth. Where, where we sit now, I think, and where I really am going to invest a lot of my time this year is around scaling. And, and what I mean by that is if you take a look in, um, in calendar 20, which was our fiscal 21, but call it calendar 20, our revenues were about $3 billion. Okay. And if you take the midpoint of our guidance for the fourth quarter of this year, uh, big round numbers, you know, and then you add the first three quarters, big round numbers is about 4.4 billion. And then if you look till to next year and you just take kind of the midpoint of street estimates, it's about 5.9 billion. So basically from 2020 to 2022, you're doubling the size of this company, right? That, so it's a double, it's not a 20%, a third. And, and when you double, there's all kinds of stresses in the system, right? Can you get enough supply? You know, there's basic things, right? Can, and that, that sort of has been plaguing everybody. But, but the bigger one from my view is we have our sights set on a much longer term, bigger goal, right? In terms of the, the scale of where we can take this. And the market we're in, as we show, it's like $30 billion market growing at teens, right? Percent. So every year this market is going to get bigger for us. But the scale factor, John, is really critical on a number of aspects. It's, it's certainly manufacturing related, but a lot of it is people related. You know, we, we have something like 800 open recs in the company right now. We're going to hire, I saw the other day, call it rough big round numbers, 200, you know, interns, maybe 250 if you had college graduates into it. So there, there's a big influx of talent and people coming in. That means, and then you've got the integra the integrations that, well, on paper they're done, like system integrations done on N5, teams in place, but you know, people haven't all worked together before, right? So how do you how do you bring all that together? And that getting all that working, that sort of base platform of not the, you know human capital management, if you will, it's actually crucial for us. And then having the leadership skills in place and leadership capability built so that we can actually be effective, right? People want to work here and they want to stay here and they feel like their boss is listening to them and the company's culture and values align with what they experience every day. You know, making sure we take this opportunity with hiring 800 people to move the needle on the applicants and ultimately the diverse candidates that are going to come in. There's all, so all these require active management. And I think if not, you end up with Brownie in motion, right? And just everybody r running around and, and, and you could have chaos. So I think, you know, we've got such a great market opportunity. The product set's great. Our engineers are top notch. Our management team is very strong, but we're growing. And I view it as a critical responsibility I have this year is to ensure that the team continues to win and succeed and that we've set up all the right um, things we need to do across the company to enable us to scale, to meet our revenue goal for next year, or, or certainly where people think we can be, but also grow it beyond that. And do all that when you're not entirely sure whether you're gonna be in the office or on the Zoom as you're building that culture and building those skills. It is uh, no small feat, but yeah. you've been known to go the distance. That's true. <laughs> to use the athletics pun, um, yeah. Matt Murphy, thanks for uh, you know unpacking so much about Marvell and sharing so much about yourself as well. Yeah, Fortnox. thanks, John. Appreciate it.